Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. I guess there's still some people are coming into the room, so I'm going to wait 30 seconds before I start. Just to save these disruptions. I believe in being late. Story of my life. Uh, yeah. Wow, packed room. <laughs> no pressure. Okay, cool. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think that's the 30 second mark, so I'll start, but there's still people coming in. So hopefully it won't cause too much disruption in the beginning. Uh, hello, NDC. I'm so glad to be back. And thank you so much all for coming to my little talk about hacking and cybersecurity. I feel honored that you are here. I'm really happy to be here. So just to kick things off, let me introduce myself. So who am I? Uh, my name is Espen Sanderlarsen, and I am a developer, a tech lead, an architect, and I've even been a hacker in my life. I have many hats in this industry. I've been working for what's coming up on 30 years, believe it or not. Uh, I'm also a musician, I'm a professional musician. I'm the father of three lovely kids who are beginning not to be kids anymore. And my interests are everything that's tech-related, hardware, tinkering, software. I love flying drones, I love graphics, programming. And I also really enjoy drinking beer and other stuff, so hit me up at the party afterwards. We will probably have a couple of beers. And I work for this little company in Norway called DB Bank. And I work in a division called New Tech Lab. We do technology driven research of emerging technologies. So do, do not ask me anything about banking, I don't know nothing about finance. And you may notice that something is missing from this slide that's typical on these kinds of slides where you list your accolades and everything about you. And then there, there's no academia on, on there. And the reason for that is simply I don't have any. I was actually, I, I quit school when I was 16 and started working. Or that's not completely true because I was actually kicked out of high school or voted out by the faculty. So this was how that panned out. There may have been some cybersecurity related issue regarding to this, this, but nothing was ever done. But well, that's the story of my life. But I thought that was an advantage because suddenly I can just start working when all my friends were going to school and I was getting paid because people were evidently willing to pay me for writing software. And I couldn't believe that thing. It felt like a scam, actually, to be honest. So I've been doing that ever since. And this talk is about cybersecurity and the offensive side, so I have to have this disclaimer since I work for DMB Bank. So you don't have to read it. I haven't read it, to be honest. Uh, it's just saying that anything I'm about to say, it's me saying, not DMB Bank. Okay? With that out of the way, let me tell you a little about my story. Because you may ask yourself, how on earth can a 16 year old kid make a career out of writing software? And that started with this thing. Anybody know what this is? Yeah, said in Norwegian. That's really that's true. There's a Commodore 64. It's an 8-bit machine. It was an amazing piece of hardware. Uh, I love that thing to death. We got that when I was six years old because my brother had gotten it in a drug deal, meaning he gave drugs away and he got the computer. Uh, and I thought that was the drug deal of the century, to be honest. But when you get a computer in a drug deal, uh, you don't get the best support package, meaning there were no manuals, there were no software. All we got was the, the lead to plug it into the TV and the power adapter. And the, uh, let's say the UI on this thing it leaves a lot to be desired compared to modern things. You actually had to know how the machine worked on a fundamental level in order to do it, get it to do stuff. And I fell in love with that thing. Uh, I, I spent weeks and nights and months and years trying to understand how that thing worked, and that was basically the start of my education. I later made my way into the demo scene and learned programming that way. And by the time I was 16, I was pretty, pretty uh, a decent programmer. Uh, but this is about hacking, not programming in general. It's more about programming mistakes. So let's define what hacking is. Well, let's not try, uh, try and define it, because Hollywood and television has done that before for us. So let's check out what they have to say. So this is a hack in progress. They have to defend in real time, and that's how, this is how they portray this. Hopefully you can listen to the conversation. No way. I'm getting hacked. 
Of and of course, you, you defend no, against no, a hack in real time on the keyboard. They've already burned through the and that's how you know you're getting hacked, because of all the pop-ups. Well, isolate the node in and what's better than one run. defender on one keyboard? Defense. Two defenders on the same keyboard. Oh, this is not because good. that's how the keyboards work, right? I can't. It's a point attack. He or she is only going after my machine. It's not possible. Very important to steal a line encryption. It would take yeah, months to get built. Like, what is that, video game? No, Tony, we're getting hacked. This guy's eating a sandwich. Hey, we're doing our entire SNS network is next. I can't stop him. Do something, McGee. And who solves the situation? Ah. Where'd it go, Abby? I didn't do anything. I thought you did. No. I did. It's a non-technical person who unplugged the computer. Uh, because this is about a government agency, and of course all essential files and uh, data that attackers were out there was in that lab terminal. So you stop it by just unplugging it. So no, that's, that's nonsensical. This is another one of my favorites. This is about a show called NCIS, and they are tracking some kind of uh, serial killer on a blog. Listen to this, gem. Listen carefully. For weeks, I've been investigating the cabby killer murders with a certain morbid fascination. This is in real time. I'll create a GUI interface using Visual Basic. See if I can track an IP address. I'll create a GUI interface in Visual Basic to see if I can find an IP address. <laughs> I don't know how to comment on that. Either somebody in the writer's room is trolling somebody, or <laughs> they just write some computer stuff. How about a movie that's named Hacker? Surely they had to do some research. Let's see. Look at that keyboard, by the way. There's a new virus in the database. What's happening? There's your virus. It's replicating, eating up memory. Uh, what do I do? Type cookie, you idiot. I'll head him off at the pass. We have a zero bug attacking all login and overlay files. Run antivirus. Give me a systems display. There's your systems display. Yeah. We're playing. We're playing. Space and dice. Dickweeds. A rabbit is in the administration system. Send a flu shot. Rabbit, flu shot, someone talk to me. A rabbit uh, replicates till it overloads a file, then it spreads like cancer. Cancer? Of course, we have these circular keyboards, right, with no symbols on them, so we know what we're doing. Yeah. How about a show about a real hacker that actually existed? They had to do it right. Okay, this is my favorite nonsensical hacking example. So, to set the scene, there's malware on an airplane, and they have to patch that airplane. So, you get in your Ferrari, you chase the plane down the runway, and you get the member of the flight crew to climb down the landing gear, to hand you an Ethernet cable to plug into your laptop. Because the only way to patch the airplane is in mid-flight through a direct connection with the cable. But that, for some reason, the hackers could remotely access the airplane. Why couldn't the defenders? So yeah, and they had to clear the tower, so what to do? Yes, we have to do this. Yeah, so I actually asked my boss, does this mean I can expense a Ferrari in case we need to patch airplanes? Sadly, it was no. Now, this is all nonsense, of course, but let's define what hacking really is. Because it used to be something different. It used to be mean people who were like curious and like to tinker with stuff and try to get things to do things they weren't necessarily intended to do. Uh, it was more about thinking outside the box, and you had some components, and you wanted them to do things, and you you want, didn't want to buy more expensive components to get them to do so, so you tried to get the most out of what you had. And the term actually that we refer to as hacking today was originally known as freaking, and that is f from phone freaking, that's why they, where the PH coming from. And the reason it was called freaking is was, it was because it was going over the phone lines, because back then there weren't really an internet. You, if you wanted to talk to a computer, you had to dial it up on the phone and talk to it, basically. And that's why, what this term comes from. But what we are talking about in the scope of this talk is basically exploiting systems through their vulnerabilities. And that, that is what hacking is in essence. 
And let me just do an informal poll of the audience, so just know what I'm working with, because this talk can take a couple of different turns based on this input. So just by, I guess I can see you, so show of hands. How many of you are programmers, coders, developers, you are at software for a living? Awesome, there's my coders. How about tech leads or architects or solution principles? You work more in whiteboards than PowerPoints. Cool. <laughs> I may say offensive things, but it's just, just for fun. Uh, how about security engineers, pen testers, CSOs, or actual hackers, white hats? Any of those? Yeah, there we have one. Cool. Uh, and what about something completely different, like a scrum master or project lead? Okay. Usually I get one, but okay, that's cool. So let's talk about hackers, because you can actually define their intentions based on the color of hat they wear. You can just look around the room and you can see all of these nice hats. So what we're talking, this comes from the old Western movies, uh, where the, the black-hatted people were the bad guys and the white-hatted people were the good guys. Uh, so the black hats, they are the malicious ones. They are the ones who does all the crap you see in the news. Then we have the white hats, they do things for good. They're usually hired to do, do things to test your applications or they do chase bug bounties and stuff like that. Then we have the gray hats, they kind of not, don't necessarily do things uh, with malicious intent, but they do it anyway and they, they, they kind of uh, gamble that disclosing what they found will get them rewarded rather than punished. And then we have the green hats. That's what I'm hoping all of you will be after this talk today. If you're interested in hacking and starting your hacker journey and learning, yeah, the Red Hats, that's not Linux fan people, it's uh, hackers who hack other hackers. And then we have the Blue Hats, that's the zero-day hunters. They get hired by large corporations in these Blue Hat events to figure out vulnerabilities before new software hits the, the world. So let's talk about why hacks happen in the first place. Um, because uh, everything should be secure, right? But the problem is that we are developers, we are humans, and we tend to make human mistakes. They're not necessarily done on purpose, but sometimes there are details we overlook, and usually uh, the devil is in those details because these software systems are large and complex, right? And we, these days, we love to trust other people's code like it's the best thing in the world. Think about all the libraries you use. Think about the modern React project. You have like 10 lines of your code, and then you have 5 million lines in NPM modules. That's other people's code that you know nothing about. And that's often where things go wrong. Uh, also, we like our tools, so if we have a hammer and we need to set up a, a cement wall, we tend to mix the cement with the hammer because we love it so much anyway. And I learned this the hard way, because I got hacked once, and boy did I get hacked, because <laughs> that was a pretty painful experience. This cinnamon bun ad will make sense in a bit. So just to set the context, I was uh, a senior developer and I got the ability to be a CTO in the startup. This startup had big ambitions. They were going to build this e-advertising platform on uh, uh, e-newspapers around the world. And this would be a connected platform where people would engage with the ads playing games and winning prizes. This is before there were any clouds, before there were any modern frameworks to do these kinds of things. And the thing is, when you're a CTO, you're also the tech lead, the principal architect, the lead programmer, and as I said, no clouds. I actually had to build, build my own cloud of data centers around the world to make this thing happen. And it was a distributed real-time system. It was pretty complex. And back then, there was only one thing you can use in the front end to make these rich experiences graphical and engaging and possible. And I guess what that was? Flash. For those of you who are uninitiated and don't know what Flash is, this is Flash. So uh, it looks like an IDE. There's code there. And there's something called ActionScript. But if you look at the sidebar, there are drawing tools. That not, that's normally not something you see in your IDE. And at the bottom, you see a timeline of keyframes, because this was software made to do animations and interactive corporate presentations. It was not meant as a client platform for a distributed system with uh, monetary value distributed in it. And I kind of knew that, uh, because, but it compiles into this bytecode format that's run by a plugin on the client side. So 
was seemingly secure, but I did say to my, my CEO and my uh, bosses that if somebody manages to decompile this thing, it would be kind of trivial to make the backend calls and generate price tickets. And uh, one morning, I got a, uh, uh, got a call, because it was e e much easier to reverse engineer than I initially had thought, and a Swedish student did just that. And uh, uh, they, they found a backend called generated price tickets, and they wrote this application called Bulle Generatorn. Because in, we had a big launch in Sweden where with the largest uh, convenience store chain in Sweden, and they had this game where you would kill flies and you would win a, a coupon to get the cinnamon bun at the store. Uh, why they would kill flies and associate that with food, I don't know, but that's marketing for you. Uh, and I got the call uh, early, early uh, Saturday morning. It was like 6 a.m. or something like that. The one person had taken out 73 cinnamon buns in one single day. And my immediate response is, that is a lot of cinnamon buns. That person really enjoys them. And of course, uh, shit hit the fan, and I had to stand straight if, if in front of the board and say, I'm sorry, it's my fault, this should never happen again. again. Don't know how to solve it, because there kind of isn't any solutions right now, but I'll figure it out. Uh, but then I got kind of sick of getting yelled at, so I, I thought, let's spin this into a good thing. So I sent my CEO to Sweden to find the student who did the thing, because they wanted to press charges and stuff. I said, no, don't do that. Bring a case of cinnamon buns and get the newspaper. And we thank him for his contribution in securing our application. And they got this big two-page spread in the largest uh, newspaper in Sweden. And it was this, this picture and cinnamon buns and this guy going like that. So it was pretty cool. And I gave this talk in Sweden earlier this, uh, this year. And <laughs> after the talk, a guy came up to me. He was like starstruck. He was like, you're Espen. You're the cinnamon bun guy. And I was like, yeah, that's me. I wrote my master thesis on your colossal failure. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm glad to contribute. And it's now part of the textbooks in the innovation uh, studies in Sweden. So yes, I have the textbook example of what not to do. That's pretty cool. So how can we get around these things, and how can we kind of pick these things up before they happen? One thing is to have pen tests, but pen tests are usually only valid once they're done, and the next time you make a change, that pen test is, in essence, invalid. And a lot of these things can actually be fixed if we developers have some of the skills involved in the offensive side, just to have that as a mindset. And a great way of gaining those skills is a concept called CTFs. Are you familiar with CTFs? OK, CTF stands for Capture the Flag, but let me let Elliot from the excellent TV show Mr. Robot define what a CTF is, because that's the only show that gets hacking somewhat right. A CTF tournament, Capture the Flag. It's like the Hacker Olympics. Teams around the world compete to solve challenges, reverse engineering, protocol exploitation, forensics. The entire city suffering an energy crisis while they're here exercising their inner anarchy. Yeah, it's an it's a opportunity to exercise your inner anarchy, which makes it pretty fun. So CTFs is this kind of um, scoped competitions or uh, tests where you can actually test out your offensive skills. And then we have different kinds of uh, flags, and it's kind of a gamified way to learn these kinds of skills because you have their prices and points and things. And when you do this, it's kind of like a catalyst way of learning things, because it's fun, it's engaging, it's, uh, it's trivial, it isn't dangerous, you're not doing anything legal, so it's pretty cool. And doing this, it changes how you approach your way of writing software, because you start to think, what happens if I put a foo in a bar or something like that? Uh, I haven't thought about that before, because we're so used to just churning out code. And Solving these challenges, uh, it, it's really cool. And we, we also hosted a couple of, of uh, CTFs inside of DMB, and the conversation and the engagement was like incredible. And we had some great water cooler discussions because cybersecurity was all over everybody's tongue at that point. And it's really just fun to be a, a villain for once. Actually, my favorite email in DMB was we had a CTF where I got an email from legal. And I thought, oh no, what is this? But it was a lawyer in legal who had performed a SQL injection attack on one of the challenges and accidentally deleted the entire database. So he wrote me a letter of apology. 
And I was thinking, when your lawyers in legal are doing SQL injection attacks, you're doing something right. So these challenges, they come in different categories. We have crypto, that's not cryptocurrency. It's about cryptography and breaking codes. You have Stego, that's kind of adjacent to crypto. It's about finding secrets hidden inside something else, like uh, binary data and an image and stuff like that. We have forensics, that's all about log analytics or analyzing data, mining data, finding all the gems in, all, and breadcrumbs and piecing those together. Reverse engineering, that's the old school hacker way of doing things. It's about figuring out how a system works and figuring out where the flaws are. That's where your buffer overflows and stack overflows and st things take place. Then there are vulnerabilities. These are usually like the, side uh, the supply chain attacks where you're exploiting some kind of known vulnerability in a third party system. Web, uh, web in itself comes with a heap of different kinds of vulnerabilities and so it's usually its own category. Then we have Pawn, that's where it should be possible to take complete ownership of that remote service and gain uh, some kind of arbitrary code execution. There are a bunch of tools, I'm not going to go through them. There are tools for everything from just uh, smashing and fussing inputs, uh, reverse engineering, decompiling, decrypting. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's a bunch more, this, th th that's what there are, and let's talk about different kinds of exploits. These are the old school exploits that we have heard a lot about. Uh, for, for example, we have like data mining, we're just trying to find data in some kind of binary file. We have disassembly, where we can disassemble an application and figure out how it works to crack it or find some kind of backend call or something like that. We have buffer overflows where you're exploiting that somebody has uh, not done memory allocation correctly and you're able to inject code or uh, control the flow of a program in runtime. And a more advanced one is called ROPing, Return Oriented Programming. That's not an agile development method. That's about riding your program flow through exploiting by chaining to get a little instruction because you know something about the libraries and the code involved. Uh, then we have stack smashing, that's basically just uh, trying to f make the stack explode and to see what happens. We have freaking, the old school way of uh, cracking telephone centrals and doing all that dial tone magic. And of course there's always malware like viruses and worms and stuff. These things uh, with ex malware as an exception aren't really that relevant anymore. They're kind of making a comeback because native code is starting to gain traction again. But these are usually native code and non-online code based things. So these days the most, most uh, uh, relevant exploits are those on the web. Because uh, back in the day this guy, that's Tim Berners-Lee, he envisioned the web as uh, this online encyclopedia where everything was linked together and it was a nice way of sharing research. Uh, so uh, the point is that it went from a static content thing to dynamic content thing because uh, people wanted to use this for more, more things to be able to generate content. Then it went into interactive, can we like have forums and talk with, with each other and stuff like that. Then people who were non-technical started getting on these platforms and creating content. That's your YouTubers and your Twitter people and all the, or that's not X it's called now. Uh, that's the thing. But they, he didn't envision that this would be the global application platform for all eternity. And that's why HTML is such a horrible API for doing front-end work. And this comes with new vulnerabilities, new, new challengers. There's so many web exploits. We have cross-site scripting, SQL injection, template poisoning, prototype pollutions, misconfigurations, broken authentication, phishing, third-party vulnerabilities, and there are countless more to talk about. There's actually so many web vulnerabilities that they, this, the world decided we need an organization to manage this, and that's called OWASP. It stands for the Open Web Application Security Project, and they, they manage all the kinds of vulnerabilities, and they were founded back in 2001, and they are all about application security awareness, and they published this top 10 lists of the most relevant threats at the moment. And these are uh, the most critical security risks that we have to attend to. There's also the thing called the CVE database, which is also this joint effort that stands for the common vulnerabilities and exploits. These are to spread awareness and knowledge about things that you have to think about when designing applications. Uh, it's a public re repository of known uh, vulnerabilities, and every one new one gets this identifier, CVE, the year it was found, and some kind of serial number. 
And we use them for risk assessment when we calculate the risk of our compromises in our systems, and we use it as an informed choice of how to design our systems and where to put in safeguards and stuff. But it's, for CTFers, it's a treasure trove of goodies, because that's where all the cool stuff is. Uh, there are a bunch of different CTFs you can try that's going on at the moment and in the, and, uh, in the world. And for instance, Hack the Box, Try Hack Me and Pico CTF are these platforms where you can join and they post new challenges regularly. Google has a yearly one where you uh, compete against other people to, to work at Google, I guess. OWASP has published this web application called the Juice Shop, which, which is essentially this Docker image, which is the most insecure web application ever built, with every vulnerability built in, and you kind of play your way through breaking the hell out of that thing. It's pretty cool. You, uh, sometimes in DMB hosts something called Hack the Bank, which, which is our CTF. It's actually going on right now at the conference, so if it's, that's my, I guess my pitch. <laughs> Come by the stand and play the CTF. And all the major security conferences, such as DEF CON and Black Hat and so on, they have CTFs and tournaments and stuff. So, but enough about talking. Let's do some demos. Let's see how these things really work. So I've prepared some CTF challenges. So this will be a lot about the terminal and stuff. So uh, hopefully you can see that. The screen is a little bit small. Can you see that? Okay, cool. So let's, let's check this out. Let's start with a classic buffer overflow thingy, okay? So we have this binary, it's called Roptric. So if I run it, it says enter your input, and I say, hello, NDC, you rock. And then it just said, have you ever been pawned, and some kind of hexadecimal number. So what I could do is I could try and um, open this thing in GDB and uh, see what happens. Do you know GDB? It stands for the GNU Debugger. It's a C and C++ native debugging tool. It's old school, and this is a certain version called Pawn Debug. It's basically uh, GDB with a couple of plugins to make it easier to, to see what's in memory and stuff. Just helps uh, demos for me to not, uh, not have to show everything. So I can, I can do some things. I can do info functions to see if uh, I have any functions and I can see symbols. So here we can see uh, all the library functions that this links to. And we have down here a function called win. That's probably something we have to call. We have a function that's vulnerable, and we have a function called main. So main probably just calls that vulnerable function, where we can check out that, uh, and we can disassemble main. We can see here, how, how many of you know x86 assembly, or the x86 uh, computer model? OK. Crash course. Breathe. This is fine. This is following a calling convention where basically it puts stuff on the stack and then it makes a call to a, to a function. So, and that function is called and it, then it sets the return point on the stack. So once that function is done, it returns back to this place and continues execution. These are all the, all the uh, instructions. So th the essential bit is this call to the vulnerable function. Uh, that, that's the essential bit. So if I do a disassembly of the uh, vulnerable function, let's see, function typing live. We can see this is a small function, and what it does, it gets, uh, it pushes uh, something on the stack, and then it uh, does uh, a string copy, called a string copy. So what this does, it takes in a buffer, and it copies that data into another buffer. And you can see here that this buffer is pretty small, 24. Whereas, where is the sub thingy in main? Uh, I can't find it. But if I found it, uh, we would see that it's, it's bigger. So if there's a buffer overflow, that means that this thing should be smaller. Uh, so let's, let's test this out. Let me set some breakpoints that are of interest. I will set a breakpoint here before we call a string copy. And I will set a breakpoint here at the return instruction, because what we're going to do is the basic example of return-oriented programming, in, because we're going to hijack this return instruction and get it to return into the win function, which resides a different place in memory. 
So let's see what happens now when I run this thing. It says enter my input. My name is Espen. Let's see. Right now I can see I'm right before string copy. You can see Espen is on the stack. Here are my registers. And the next thing that's going to happen is I'm going to, to call uh, that string copy. And if I continue, we can now see I'm at the, uh, where are we? Here, we're at the, this is the instruction pointer. That's the next instruction that's uh, there. And it's pointing to uh, the return instruction. And we can also see that the, the stack pointer is pointing to the return address back in main. So if I do a step, we can now see I'm back in main at that point. And if I continue the execution, it will ex exit. So that's, that happens. But what happens if I, if I do... Um, uh, okay. Uh, what happens if I do this? And let me see. If I run, I do a Perl script and execute some inputs. And I have to be careful with using the correct quotes. And I do print. I'm going to use Perl. I, I like it. It's quirky. Uh, I'm going to do A. And I'm going to do that 44 times. I'm going to concatenate four Bs. This just pipes that as input into the uh, into the program. Uh, so what happens now? Uh, did I not close? I didn't close that thing correctly. Now oh, I need to close the pran. So there we go. So now we can see I have my long string uh, here, and if I do continue after the string copy, we'll see something funny happening. So the base pointer is now four A's, and the stack pointer is now four B's. Meaning if I continue execution now, I will get a segmentation error because it can't find 42, 42, 42 in memory. So if I print the win function to see where it resides, we can see it's uh, at uh, 08, 04, 91, E6. So if I change my B's to, uh, let's do E6, it's little endian, so I have to do this in reverse, 91, 04, 08. If I run that, hopefully things will happen. I'm at string copy, so it doesn't look any suspicious yet. But if you now look, this, the stack pointer is now at win in the win function. So if I now do continue, or I can let me do a step, you can see that now I'm executing in win. So I've changed the control flow of this program in real time. And of course, we're doing this in pawn debug locally, so it doesn't make sense because I could like just do jump to to win directly. So it doesn't. So why would we do this? But the thing is that if this now is running remotely, and if I copy my exploit like this, and I quit the program, I have this running on localhost 42. So if I netcat to that, that's a remote system. Just to prove it, here's my Docker. So it runs here. Uh, using socket as a server, and it's uh, serving on that port. So if I do that, and I pipe in my exploit, come on, there we go. I overflowed that buffer, and I got it to run the win function. The win function prints out the flag file, and I find my secret. So that's a classic buffer overflow attack. Let's do some more fun things. Let's see. Uh, let's do some let's do some web stuff. So I have uh, this thing called calculator. It runs on localhost 44. So if I bring up uh, localhost 44, we can see we have this calculator, uh, and it seems to be just a benign calculator. I can hit one times six, and I execute. Amazingly, that evaluates to six. Uh, but I can also see I have a cos function where I can take a cosine or something, and it executes and I get that cosine value. What's special about that? Well, let's use WhatWeb to see what we're working with. So, HTTP, oh, come on, keyboard, local host um, 44. So, it says it's powered by Express. That means that this is probably Node.js. So there's JavaScript involved. Well, 
since I'm, I can send functions, is, and let me just check the network to see what happens. If I do a cosine of 8, for instance, and I execute that, it sends something to an endpoint. So it sends the expression cosine to the endpoint. So this evaluation is happening server-side. And it's JavaScript. What do you think is the, 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 the chance that I can send the function over that thingy to see if that works? Let me just try. So if I do, if I do uh, var a equals function like this, uh, console log hello, does that work? Uh, I have to close that. That, sh that should do something. If I execute that, I get an error, endified. It doesn't want to do that. So I can't do, do anything malicious that way. But let's go back to this thing again. This is, ev this is evidently a function. So how can it call that thing server-side? It has to call a function at some point, right? Wh what do you think is the chance that they actually just use the math cos function? And why is that relevant? Well, JavaScript has this quirk where if you do console log and I do constructor, it will call function internally with the definition of this thing. Uh, or I can just do more easy return ndc like that. And if I do that as an immediately invoked expression, it will actually execute that inside. It should, should do that. Uh, if, I, if I actually manage to write console log rightly, correctly, it should. So yeah, it just re executes that function inside that. So what I can do is I can do a little, uh, I can do a little proof of concept. So if I do cos, and I do constructor to see if, if I can find that. And I do return one for fun. I can do an execute there. And I got, got an undefined. I probably didn't, probably don't have the typo. Let's cop copy it here just to be sure not to waste your time. So if I execute that, I got the one. Nice, that's cool. What else can I do with this thing? Well, I could see if I can spawn a process. So I have this, let me show you. Let me do this and uh, let's do calc. And if we do, uh, let me see which, which one is. Which one is the correct one? Yeah, so yeah, if I do this thing, so let me do uh, bat exploit three. You can see what I'm doing here is I'm using that constructor to return <laughs> a handle to child process and spawning bin bash, and then piping that over a pipe to this endpoint. Now that endpoint is wrong, so I have to change that. So if, if I just quickly do that, let me just do putty because I'm going to set up a remote shell uh, to reverse into. So I'm going to change my, my exploit uh, here. Uh, should I prepare this? I thought I, thought I had done this like this. Probably forgot to save. And let's do this part. So if I load this up and, and connect it to it, oh, that's small. Let me see if I can change that. Uh, appearance. Let's do 18. Apply. Yeah, that's that's better. So if I set up. Uh, Remote listener on this thing, it's now listening on port 1337. And if I go to my calculator and I enter my exploit uh, and I execute it, see what happened in, in that shell. Look at the user. I'm no longer Arn, uh, Azure user at Arna, I'm now root at somewhere else. I'm inside that container. I can now do whatever I want. I own that system now. 
And for instance, I could then do, uh, I can just cat out the index.js. And this is the this is the source code for that server. And here I will find the secret. That's the flag I'm after in this case. So that's one way of doing that. Let me show, how, do we have time for one more? Yeah, let's, let's do one more. Uh, that's fine. Let me ex uh, exit. Exit that, so I'm back there. Let's do let's do a disco. That's fun. Let's see. Okay, so if I do Docker PS again, it's at Docker run strange dash d disco, and let's just do port. Oop, let's do port eighty eighty to eighty eighty. Disco. Okay, I have to build it. Uh, sorry about that. Let's try that again. Great. So now I have localhost disco at 8080. So this uh, says it's Santa's North Pole disco featuring DJ Euler. There's some tickets and some info. I can click stuff. But if I do investigations, I will see nothing happens on the client side on this thing. So let's do another what web to see what we're dealing with in this instant. instant. Let's see. Localhost 8080. So hopefully that will give us some informed uh, information that we can use. Let's see. Come on, it's local. <laughs> okay, here we go. So we can see it's using Apache Coyote 1.1. That means that we're talking about uh, Java and Tomcat. Okay, that gives me, I, I, of course, you saw I built the image, so it says Tomcat, but forget that we saw that. If I do some research, and I, I will go find Google. I will find in the NIST uh, frameworks uh, uh, database. I will find this CV called 2017, uh, where uh, it gives uh, uh, a way to upload a JSP because of some kind of misconfiguration in Tomcat 9, 8.52, 8.522, 8.46. Seven to seven eighty one with HTTP put enabled. Uh, it says it was possible to upload a JSP file to the server via a specially crafted request. Specially crafted, so this, I, it had to be difficult, right? Let's just see how special that request is. So let me just bat out attack. So that's that specially crafted request. It's basically just the puts with the data uh, in the body. So I've crafted, or I've got, I've, I think I found most of this online, a little web, web shell in JSP. It's just a form, takes the value in, and it executes command on the server side. So it's basically just a little send a command and execute it and give me back what, what happened. So let me just run that attack. So let's see. Just double check that my attack. Okay, so I have to change that. Let me do that quickly. Because I did 8088. No, 8080, not 8888. Like that. So I just changed it. That's the attack. So if I run that now, just to show you that uh, there's nothing here right now. So if I do exploits, JSP. Nothing, but if I go back uh, and I do not that attack, it calls that backend server, uploads that shell, and if I now go to the web, and now I have a handy little shell where I can do commands. I can do ls and see what happens. Hey, I'm running commands on the server via a web page I uploaded. Because this was a thing in all of those versions of uh, Tomcat. That's pretty neat. And uh, if I do on the root, I will find my flag. And I can just do cat, whoop, 
cat root flag and get out the secrets. That sure killed that cat. Okay, one more funny, funny one because this this is my favorite one. So let me do the Grinch serial killer. Let's do. Uh, did I do uppercase? Of course I did. So let's do. I have to remember the port. Let's see. Not always. I'm do I'm doing. And I even didn't go drinking last night. I can't figure. Okay, it's at 40. So let's do localhost 40 to find another website. There we have the North Pole's most wanted uh, uh, fairy tale uh, characters. And I can do what web again, and I will figure out that this is an OJS application, powered by Express again. So nothing is going on here on the client side again, except for one thing. If I look in the application thing, I get this thing called a package, which is interesting. It's a cookie. And if I do base64d and I just pipe uh, that in, uh, we can see that it's uh, this JSON structure. Username, Santa, country, North Pole, and Elf will. So if I do, let's see, do, 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 do. what do you think is the chance that this is evaluated on the, on the, on the server in some way? Because we do see, um, if I refresh again, it says Santa there, and it now says Santa there now. But if I look in the sources, there are no client-side libraries doing anything with that cookie. So that means it has to be rendered server-side. And it has to use that information for something. Uh, it's Node, so there's probably some serialization going on. And if you're a new Node developer, and you need to serialize and deserialize something, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it just be natural to just do this, Google Node Serialize? which is an npm package. It has 1,500 weekly downloads right now. But look at that headline. Serialize an object including its function to JSON. Somebody thought that was a great idea. And it may not be evident why it's not a good idea, but let's look at the GitHub. The first thing on the GitHub is a security warning. Please don't use this thing because it's terribly unsafe. Because they use this syntax where you can add this function structure and it will be evaluated on the server side because it's a function. And because we can immediately invoke functions in JavaScript, it will be just run at hands value by the server. This is something we can use. So if I, just, just as a proof of concept, uh, take this JSON structure, let me just clear the screen to clear the air, where I say it's, it's username Espen, the country and the Z, and city code will. So if I do base 64, uh, I'll have to remove any white space. So it's, it's 5 0, I believe. Hopefully. If that's wrong, shout out. So now I have this cookie. And I copy that out. I go to the website. I refresh. And I take this cookie and I replace it with this thing. Come on. Uh, do refresh. <coughs> Come on. You lost the opening pair. I lost the opening pair. Ah. Yeah, I did. I did. Thank you. No? Okay. Okay, let's do that again. Let's just copy the thing. Oops. Whoop. Again, base, whoop, base 64. No white space, please. I missed the E. Uh, I, missed the e. Um, I should have gone drinking last night. That's, 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 the, that's the thing. <laughs> now we have it. That's, that looks more correct. Like this, copy. I take this and I refresh my cookie. Come on. Why why you do this to me live? Maybe it's the thing. Let me just cave and use uh, uh, online. Maybe it's just me who copy pasted wrong. Let me take this. Jason. Ah, oh, that was a problem. It was a 
There was nuts on it. Okay, couldn't see those nuts. Come on. There we go. Ah. Oh. In nuts, we are we are killed. Okay, so this is the it says log, logged in as husband. So that means that it, it evaluated it. So if I now now open my trusty reverse shell again, and let me just check that I have the correct IP address. I do. And if I do this, copy, and I use my trusty <laughs> one. So uh, let me just bat out that exploit so you can see it. Bat uh, exploit. You can see I'm um, VCH. That's my other. That's my handle. Working class hacker. And here we have this structure that we saw on the GitHub. Again, I'm just spawning bash and piping a pipe back to my uh, nasty little box. And if I do that again, I, and we can see that I'm listening here on Arna, and I'm taking this thing, and I'm running that. Now I'm VCH. And you can see now I'm node at somewhere in the app, and now I'm complete control of that server as well. And that is because somebody thought this was a good idea. It's a feature, so it's and it still has 1,499 weekly downloads this week, and it has it's used in thousands of projects, which is kind of mind-boggling. Okay, let's go back and wrap this up while we still have time. Let's see, does that work? No, I don't have present review. <laughs> yeah, okay. There we go. So, uh, some takeaways. CTFs are fun and educational. They, they are really engaging. It teaches you good stuff. And while, while you build these offensive skills, it get, makes you more and more aware of security and why it's important. And it also makes you think about your code bases differently. Uh, and I want you all now to go out and be curious, flush your inputs, test your applications yourselves. It doesn't uh, remove the need for external pen tests for, for no reason, but it's still a valid thing to do, continually test things with an offensive mindset as well. So put in your hoodies and go hack, hack, hack. And if you want to try yourself with a live CTF, there's, uh, there's or a non-live CTF, uh, I have built a little one that you can just download. It's a Docker-based thing where you can test your skills on different things. But if you want to take a chance of winning the prizes at uh, our NDC stand, we have this CTF, that's Hack the Bank. Uh, it's a fun one this year. So that's how you join. You can just use your Google or Microsoft account, or you can register for a dummy account at the site. Uh, and it's uh, very cool. If you want to follow me, this is what I look like from behind. Or if you want to follow me online, I have two things. I have LinkedIn or I have a GitHub uh, where I do my musings. So thank you. That was all I had for you guys. <laughs> if you have some questions. Yeah, LinkedIn page, sure. <laughs> If you're wondering if you want to talk to me, I'm here at the conference. I really enjoy talking to people, drinking beer and having fun. And if you're in the CTF and you're at the party, you might be able to convince me to help you out <laughs> if I get drunk enough. Have a nice conference. <laughs>